You know, I decided I should probably start writing my sermons before I publish descriptions of what they will cover. Usually, when the contact is due, and I could blame Vicki, but it's not really her fault. I sit up at my desk late in the evening, thinking about possible topics, and an idea will pop into my head, and I'll say, I think I could talk about that. Maybe they'd like to hear about that. And then a week or two later, when faced with the task of completing said missive, I typically find out that that isn't really what I want to do. And so why should this week be different than any other week? <laughs> I said I wanted to talk about human nature, but I realized that it's an elusive topic, a slippery wicket, because push come to shove, I have no idea if there is such a thing. As humans, we all share characteristics and capacities, many of which help define us as human. Similarly, we tend to arrive on Earth with certain near universal instincts. Almost all people have these. We all have that reptilian self that will fight or flee from danger. We all become squeamish around foul smelling things, creepy crawly things, and yucky stuff in general. More importantly, we all show up requiring active nurturing and care and manifest almost complete selfishness during our earliest months. What else does a baby say to you besides, I'm hungry, I'm uncomfortable, I'm tired? You know, it has one word to express all those things. This might project into a lifetime of selfish and greedy behavior except there are social counterforces. Our earliest and most selfish needs are typically met in the hands of a nurturer, a carer, a love giver. And before we reach one year of age, research has shown that we tend to prefer nice people to not so nice people. We have learned to like helpers more than haters probably because we've been so dependent on the provision of help and probably worried about the possibility that help and nurture might not occur. Now, all of this is known and observable, and we know that our development relies on both our genetic predisposition, what we learn in our environments as we experience life. But we're so varied in our responses, we end up turning out as an incredible variety of personalities and attributes. If there is a human nature, it should imply that one set of tendencies and characteristics define the essence of being a person. And we know this is not true. However the recipes work, we are all some mixture of nature and nurture, genes and environment. In the shake and bake of family life and growing up, developmental biology and behavioral controls, somehow we emerge as ourselves. As the poem said, we and only we fit in our own skins. Well, if I'm gonna deny human nature that such a thing exists, so categorically, why was I interested in it in the first place? Well, I think I have two main reasons. One has to do with religion, and one has to do with understanding morality. Sticking to religion at the start and looking at our Abrahamic traditions, we are told that we are made in God's image. We're not gods ourselves, that's made clear. But we have free will that we should use to work towards perfectibility, to enhance our likeness to God by living within God's rule and direction in a manner that is pleasing to God. If we do use our free will to work for goodness, excuse me, if we do not use our free will to work for goodness, well, we fall from God's grace 
and behave in a disappointing and sinful manner. And yes, the word sin shows up here in religion. And much of our traditions, our fallibility assumes a huge bandwidth to the point that many feel humankind is tainted by a condition of original sin, innate depravity, straight to hell unless corrected. The story is that our sins arose because we couldn't follow God's rules. We could not do what was right, even when instructed clearly. And whether or not you buy into the whole Garden of Eden story with Adam and Eve and the serpent and the apple, the bottom line is that the Christian world came to know ourselves as sinful beings that needed carrots and sticks, really big sticks, to act right instead of to act wrongly. And this takes us to the whole concept of morality. What is right? What is wrong? And how are we supposed to know the difference? Once again, in America, the standard response is the church and Christian teaching. You learn this when you are not a good church-going and God-fearing Christian, because we only seem to trust moral instruction as it comes through the church. Atheists remain among the least trusted and most vilified subgroups in the American public, at least through public opinion surveys. They just can't be trusted. The assumption is that religion does teach morality and that these teachings ultimately come from God. Now, unless you big, dig pretty deep into the Hebrew Bible, things like dietary restrictions and that kind of thing, my reading of the Bible suggests that it's pretty light on moral guidelines especially those that believers are compelled to embrace. The biggie, of course, is the Ten Commandments. They were given by God to Moses on Sinai and are held covenantal by Jew and Christian alike. And in case you missed the movie, I am the Lord God. Thou shalt not have other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. Thou shalt not take the name of thy Lord God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. The first four, they're all about God. Honor your father and mother. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not, shalt not bear false witness. And thou shalt not covet. I don't see these as a viable moral framework. As I said, the first four just tell us how to honor God. I like the fifth, the one that says we should honor our fathers and mothers. That's positive. But I wonder why the bounds are so narrow. Why just them? And the others are pretty much no-brainers. Don't kill, don't steal, don't lie, don't covet. And I'll skip adultery. That's a whole different discussion. The take home point though, is that this is weak ethics. The golden rule, which appears in the gospels and in most major religious traditions in some way, is a much stronger moral guide. Treat fellow humans with care and compassion. I truly wish that the gospels and the teachings of Jesus were more fundamental to Christianity, Christian education, and Christian morality. But even the idea that God is the source of our knowledge of right and wrong is problematic. And it's been understood that way since the times of the Greek thinker Plato. In Eurythophro, Plato separated morality from the divine judgment with the following question. Is something good because God defines it as right? Or does God define it as right because it is good. Is it good because God says so, or does God say so because it's good? Now, most of us would pick the second because the first one just feels so arbitrary. However, if God defines it as right because it is already good, 
then the goodness is antecedent to the claim. It was right and good before God said it was so. And following this logic, I'm convinced that our sense of right and wrong, good and evil, is not grounded in religious revelation. Churches indeed can teach morality, but I really don't think they invented it. The question of how we know right and wrong, what is the real basis of human morality, that becomes the question we care about. Taking God out of the equation is scary, mostly because that leaves us with, well, it leaves us with us. Philosophers tried looking to human reason, and this has kept them busy for centuries. The search for universal and unyielding moral principles has been much like the search for the Holy Grail, and pretty much is futile. Only Monty Python hasn't made a movie about it yet. Some tried to judge actions by their consequences, with those that are deemed good promoting the greatest happiness for the least cost. Some tried to judge intention as the basis for the morality of action, ignoring the consequences. Some tried to define an idea of human virtue, a virtue that necessarily produces goodness in its image. Some tried to argue that we're genetically predisposed to know right or wrong. By the way, I just gave you a whole course in philosophy, ethical philosophy in four sentences. But I'll highlight, highlight some more recent study by psychologist Lawrence Kohlberg at Harvard. He designed, defined a model of a six-stage process of human moral development that became widely accepted across the field. He saw subjects pass through a regular pattern of moral growth from self-centered motives. Oh, wait a minute. Excuse me. He saw subjects pass through a regular pattern of moral growth that started with the self-centered motives in the young child, passed through interpersonal and relational connections, and eventually moved into principal action as we approach adulthood. He claimed that this is a universal process, and we move in a linear path from moral infancy towards ethical maturity. He relied on responses to a story about a fictional man named Heinz. Heinz could not afford the medicine his wife needed, and the pharmacist refused to discount it. So what did Heinz do? He opted to steal the medicine that his wife needed. Was this right or wrong? Many generations of Kohlberg subjects at many ages reacted to this story. And they told Kohlberg why Heinz was right or wrong and why. And from this, this whole model was developed. One of Kohlberg's top students was a woman named Carol Gilligan. And she replicated this work, but with one key difference. Unlike Kohlberg, who tended to rely on his Harvard men, her panels were composed of women. She found much less clarity and a much less linear path of ethical development. Indeed, her female students spent more time trying to modify the narrative in search of a path to reconciling the interests of Heinz and the pharmacist. Her analysis showed that female subjects consistently look to relationships and orientation and showed far less concern for rule and principle. Their judgment was more contextual, it was communal, and they appeared to occupy just a different moral world where fostering connections is a primary piece. Kohlberg's men were far more comfortable with the more individualistic determination based on principle and law. Gilligan turned this in Ethics of Care, which she carefully did not claim to be a precursor to moral judgment, 
just a different way of navigating moral issues. So really, she really challenged this research with what we all know is that, what is it, men are from Mars and women from Venus? And obviously none of the gender stereotypes hold perfectly, but there really tended to be a pattern there. Nature, nurture, who knows? Many ideas here, all conclusive, inconclusive. We looked at religion, we looked at philosophy, we looked at psychology, and each is struggling with how to define human morality and how it manifests. Maybe these are all asking the wrong question. We're all deeply connected to our own moral sensibilities, and we know that little can upset us as much as when they are violated, when we truly do feel moral outrage. Maybe we should start to think less about whether morality or immorality is intrinsic in the actions themselves, and instead become more concerned with our responses and how we feel about them. Let our outrage or our pleasure help guide us to cases where we need to unpack and to process what we might be able to control. I don't believe that morality is arbitrary or that it should be manipulated to fit specific needs or wants. At the same time, I do think our moral feelings are always being negotiated and renegotiated within the context of current culture, information, and understanding. Essentially, I'm claiming that our highest morality is really just a normative construction that adjusts as our realities and circumstances evolve. Moral relativism, I think that's what that is. Is it really so far out? Our position on so many issues changes. Currently, we hold deep aversion to practices of honor killing, dueling, human slavery, female foot binding, genital mutilation, arranged marriage, widow burning, and many other practices that have been acceptable and honored in recent years, either in our society or in others. We hope to see these practices ended everywhere, and we exert considerable moral, economic, and political pressure trying to make that occur. And we see progress in social evolution, and we know that moral change can occur, and somehow we know that this is progress. Closer to home, we've recently seen rapid shifts in values about things such as gender roles marriage equality, racial and gender equality, and other major social issues. The path is never smooth or constant, but again, we see change occurring. Other value issues like women's medical rights and abortion access remain on the edge in our society, and the intensity of feeling in the political debates su suggests that the moral depth involved is huge. This is the nature of a value conflict and a moral quandary. At the same time in the future, at some time in the future, we know it will be resolved and that slowly that resolution will begin to feel normal and right and moral and ethical to all, but not yet. I recently read a work by Todd May who, against my wisdom, is another philosopher. He recently published a book titled A Decent Life, and the title pretty much summarizes his message. May claims that not only don't we agree with all moral absolutes, but that even if we did, living in them is pretty much beyond our ability. Full-blown altruism which has to be the moral high, it's just too high a bar for most of us. Instead, what we should aspire to, instead of perfection, is decency, 
just common decency, being as good as we can, being good enough. Some principles can get us started, and the golden rule, however we phrase it, is a wonderful guide. The important first step in achieving simple decency is recognizing the other, whoever it is, and responding to their needs and interests as we follow our own. We can't expect perfection, but we can work with what we know and see and decide when and where we need to learn more. But it all begins with appreciating that every person you engage with, whether in person and directly or in some indirect manner, is important and worthy of concern. This is not an appeal for loosening our morals, but maybe an admission that we might reduce our expectations of ourselves and others just a little. Our goal is simply to navigate the world with a certain moral gracefulness. In short, this is a suggestion that we try to live our larger lives in the way we hope to live within this congregation, We're premised on sharing, recognition, cooperation, and mutual assistance and support. Now, when I said I would address human nature, I did promise to ask why people's beliefs about human nature matter. And I think I need to say something about this before I leave you. As religious liberals, we come from a tradition where the well of optimism is truly deep. And we tend to believe in the fundamental goodness of people and their aspiration towards growth and improvement. The fundamental worth and dignity of every person. If we lived in a world where human nature is conceived in self-interest and greed, where we expect each person to only be looking out for number one, then how we would see the world would be different. We would be more combative, more defensive, and put far more energy into protecting and bounding what we have against others. And I think I just fundamentally describe much of the gulf between the political right and the political left in this country. And the reason why there is no such thing as ordinary politics or process in American society these days, everything feels like a value contest, maybe because it is. We just need to figure out how to make everyone relax, ourselves and them. Good luck. So be it and blessed be. Could you now rise, if you're willing and able, in singing hymn number 313, Oh, what a piece of work we are. <laughs>